Hi everyone. Today I am really excited to have Dr. Ken Berry on a virtual visit to New Zealand. Yes. Um, Dr. Berry. Until we can come in person, this is the best it can be. Uh, well, I hope you make it soon and um, come and visit me in my little um, Bay of Plenty town in Kaurau. That would be wonderful. Absolutely. Um, so thanks for taking time out of your schedule today. So Dr. Berry is a practicing board certified physician with 20 years experience. That's it. And you've also got an Amazon best-selling book called Lies My Doctor Told Me. That's um, right. I'll put a link to that in the show notes and on my website as well. Um, I think it's an absolutely great read. Um, Thank you very much. <laughs> I love the I love the humour in it, um, and it's so full of misinformation that you know things that we all believe. And there's also a bit of a challenge to your colleagues to take a bit of a look at themselves and how they're managing their patients. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that's something lots of us can relate to. Um, you're also a passionate advocate for understanding healthy nutrition and you run a very successful YouTube channel um, over like 500,000 subscribers I believe. Over a million now. Over a you million. Yeah you haven't checked in in a while. Oh no I check in all the time but I just haven't I, I probably haven't seen how many subscribers yeah. there are. It's, it's growing quite briskly and I think it's because people are hungry for real information about health and medicine and nutrition. Uh, I don't think it's anything special I'm doing. I think just explaining the truth of the matter in common sense terms and plain language, people seem to enjoy that. Yes, I think, you're, um, I think you've got a really great way of explaining things in quite simple terms. And for, you know, for my listeners here, You've got lots of snippets of information as well, so they don't have to tune in for like an hour at a time. They can just catch 10 or 15 minutes on a specific topic as well. Yeah, exactly. If you want to listen to me for a long time, then I've, I've been uh, a guest on many, many podcasts and uh, Zoom calls like this. They're out there on the internet. A quick search will find them. But uh, when I'm making a YouTube video, I try to keep it very short and to the point and give you all the information you need without a lot of uh, superfluous fluff. <laughs> and I love your humor as well that you um, that comes across in them. So um, to kick off, would you tell us a bit about your own health journey? Because you've got a bit of an interesting backstory and yeah, then a little sure. bit about why you wrote your book and you know what the message is you want to get out there. Yeah, sure. So growing up for the first 25 to 27 years of my life. I was very slender. Uh, it was just impossible for me to gain weight at all. And I would work out every day and I would drink lots of, of uh, heavy whipping cream because back then I believed that that's how you gained weight was to eat or drink lots of fat. And uh, that never worked for me somehow. But then when I got busy in my medical residency training and then in the first few years of my medical practice, uh, I was just, you know, I was very busy. I would just reach and grab, get a soft drink and a hot dog or, you know, a soft drink and some kind of pastry. And uh, in residency training, there's the drug reps are always bringing donuts and cookies and these delicious little pastries and treats. And so rather than take the time to eat a proper meal, I would just grab some of that and wash it down with some lemonade or a soft drink or, or you know, some junk like that or some fruit juice which is also junk and it didn't take long at all for me to start gaining weight on that high carbohydrate processed diet and uh at the maybe two or three years into my medical practice i looked up and i was morbidly obese i weighed 297 pounds i was pre-diabetic i think my a1c was 6.1 uh very inflamed very miserable uh depressed and anxious at the same time. I had pretty bad rosacea that was hard to hide and I was fat. And so the part of the Southern United States I grew up in, 
people are very quick to call you if you're full of crap. They're, they'll call that out very quickly. They're not shy at all about that. And so for me to be a fat, unhealthy doctor uh, going into patients and, and counseling them on, you need to lose some weight and you need to eat this and that. And I would lose eye contact with them because they would look down at my belly and then back up in my, my eyes. And I was like, okay, okay, that's great. So they just looked at my, my gut. Here in the South, we call that Dunlap because it's done lapped over your belt. <laughs> right. And, and so I was like, well, how, am, how I can't even be a, a useful physician in the, I can't be a fat doctor. I can't be unhealthy. How, how do I have any authority or any uh, gumption to, to proceed to, you know, inform people how to be healthy and what to eat? I don't even know myself. And so I kind of went back to the drawing board with regards to nutrition and scrapped everything I thought I knew <clears throat> And the first thing I tried was eating the diet we were taught to eat in medical school. And so I stopped all the junk and I started eating lots of whole grains and lots of fruits and lots of vegetables and drinking, you know, only organic, fresh squeezed fruit juice and uh, avoiding all saturated fat and jogging four or five times a week. And on that diet, I gained another five or 10 pounds. And it was at that point I said, you know what? I don't know anything about nutrition. It's obvious. And neither did my professors in medical school. So I just erased everything I thought I knew. And I went back to the drawing board and, and I started reading literature about how to, how to feed a human animal from lots of different sources. And I put, picked up a book by doc, Dr. Robert Atkins, The Diet Revolution, and a book by Mark Sisson called The Primal Blueprint, and a diet by Lauren Cordain called The Paleo diet. And, our, and, and those are just some of the many books I read, but those three all seem to kind of agree with each other. And they all seem to have the exact opposite approach of every single thing that I was taught in medical school. And, and I had never tried that kind of diet. It's like, oh, eat lots of meat, eat lots of fat, don't eat grains, don't, don't drink low fat dairy. Okay, I'll give that a try. See, I mean, it sounds delicious. So maybe, maybe it'll work. And immediately, and what I didn't know it then, but what I was doing in reality was cutting down my amount of total carbohydrates I was taking in a day. And I was getting inflammatory things like grains and beans out of my diet. And so immediately I started to lose fat. I reversed my prediabetes very quickly. Uh, my heartburn got maybe 20, 30% better. My rosacea got 20 or 30% better. And I didn't stop reading. I kept looking and kept searching. And I heard about this thing called the ketogenic diet. It was supposed to put you in ketosis. And so every doctor, when they first hear about this diet, they're mortified because they, they remember a thing called ketoacidosis back from medical school and residency. And so they definitely don't want to be in ketoacidosis because that'll kill you. And so I, I, after once I understood the difference between ketoacidosis and ketosis, I started trying the ketogenic diet and, and my rosacea went away. My heartburn got 80% better. I was steadily losing fat on a, on a weekly, if not a daily basis. It was noticeable in my clothes and on the scale. And so that, that's kind of, and so then it, that was, it was at that point <clears throat> when patients were remarking, doc, you look great. What are you doing? So when someone asked that question, I would just tell them what I was doing. And then I also reached out to my most morbidly obese patients who had a, a body mass index of 35 or above. Just they, they were, you know, basically ready for, for bariatric bypass or bariatric surgery. And I said, hey, you should try this diet. Uh, go ahead and try it. And I would send them a little 20 page handout that I had typed up. And I would say, come see me in a month. We'll check your labs, make sure everything's okay. And I was just going to use keto as a one to three month long hack at that time because I didn't understand the ancestral appropriateness of it like I do now. And so I was just going to do that for one, two, three months until I got my weight down and then go back to eating the whole grains and avoiding saturated fat. But the more I read and the more I researched, I actually discovered there's actually research supporting eating a, a low carbohydrate diet like that. I had no idea. No one's ever mentioned that to me as a doctor. And so I, I kept doing another month and another month of keto and I kept having more and more benefits. And as many of us who are eating a low carbohydrate or a ketogenic diet know, the, the, the fat loss slows down after you've lost the majority of your fat. 
but that doesn't mean it stops. It just gets slower. And so as you continue to eat a low carbohydrate diet, the benefits continue to accrue. They just don't accrue as quickly as they do in the very beginning. And so that's, that's kind of my story in a nutshell. And that's why now I'm a, I try to be as big an advocate as I can for a low carb or a ketogenic diet. Yeah, that's, that's a fascinating story. And, you know, there are many of your colleagues who have experienced similar sort of revelations, aren't, aren't there? Yep. Um, Absolutely. And, and any doctor who looks into the ketogenic way of eating and tries the ketogenic way of eating, I haven't met one yet who says, yeah, I tried that. It didn't work. I quit it. They, they're all like, no, that's the way. That, that is the best way, especially if you're obese or morbidly obese. There is no better diet than the ketogenic diet. And then the more they read and research, the more they start coming around and saying, actually, it's good for this and that and the other as well. Yes, the diet that you just described that you were eating is exactly what I was taught to teach my clients, um, you know, in my nutrition training. And, right. you know, it's scary because it's still being advocated out there. Um, sure. All our health guidelines, you know, eat all these healthy grains and cereals. And we have this huge plant-based advocacy in New Zealand at the moment. So get rid of the meat and the fat and eat all yep. these plant foods. Um, what, do you, what, what would you say to that? Well, here's the, well, there's multiple problems with their logic. But the first and foremost problem with their logic is that here in the United States, and I suspect it's that way in New Zealand as well, the average person already eats a plant-based diet. And so for lunch, they'll have a hamburger and fries and a Coke. And so the only meat on the plate is the little two ounce hamburger patty, which may be half soybean, you don't know. And so the bun, the vegetables, the fries, the vegetable oil, that everything was fried in, and the Coke, which is full of high fructose corn syrup, which comes from corn, that, that diet is 80% plant-based, isn't it? And it so is. the, average, the average person who's getting fatter and sicker by the day is already eating a plant-based diet. Now, of course, the, the plant-based advocates would say, well, yeah, but that's a highly processed plant-based diet. And that is true, there's no doubt. But even if you, if you switch to a raw vegan diet, uh, you're still gonna be getting way too many carbohydrates. You're not gonna be getting enough omega-3 fatty acids. You're not gonna be getting enough of the essential amino acids. You're gonna develop vitamin and mineral deficiencies. And you're going to have to eat six times a day in order to have a full belly in order to function. And I, as a busy physician and, and a busy YouTuber, I don't have time to eat six times a day. And so I, I like eating once or twice a day. I have, I have hours more in the day to be productive by, by eating a very low carbohydrate diet. And so, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the thing most people, probably the average listener, doesn't understand is you're already eating a plant-based diet with just a small serving of meat on the side. That's if you s separate everything on your plate, it's 70% vegetable already. It's 70% plant-based. So, I mean, how plant-based do they want us to be? Yeah, I did a little bit of an exercise um, looking at sort of different diets you know like a vegan compared with a sort of a mixed diet to a sort of more ketogenic diet and I looked at the calorie intake so what I did was worked out how much you needed to eat to get your essential amino acids per meal and then I looked at the calorie intake and the calories in a vegan plant-based diet are three times as much. Yeah absolutely if you eat enough of a plant-based diet to get all the essential fatty acids and amino acids and vitamins and minerals that you need each day, you're gonna get fat because you're gonna be eating so many grams of carbohydrates to try, because plants, surprise, surprise, are not nutrient dense. Even kale and spinach and broccoli and asparagus are not nutrient dense superfoods. Compared to a serving of beef or, or, or fish, they're nutrient, they're void of nutrients. They're very, they pale in comparison to any cut of meat with regards to fatty acids, amino acids, vitamins, minerals. And so, yeah, if you try to get everything you need each day in a plant-based diet, you're definitely gonna get fat because you're eating a very, very high carbohydrate diet. So what, what do you say to people who 
they go to their GP and their lipids have gone up, you know, yep. their cholesterol's gone up and the doctor freaks out. What do you say to them? Well, what I do is I point them to the research that their doctor doesn't know about. And I just recently made a video on my YouTube channel about hidden research. And there are three huge, very long, randomized controlled trials in humans. <clears throat> and now that what I just said is a mouthful, but you know what that means, but let me break it down for the listeners. So the, the, the best study that we can do in science is a randomized controlled trial. And that doesn't mean it's that kind of study is perfect. It just means that you are protecting that the, the results from the bias of the researchers or the bias of the participants from slipping into the results. So you get a more unbiased result from that. So, and so these three studies were randomized and controlled. One of them was even double blinded, which is the ultimate kind of research study. And it was done in humans, not in rats, not in rabbits, not in mice. It was done in human beings. So that's very applicable to us because I assume most of the listeners are human. And then also they were very long trials. They lasted for years. They weren't a three week study or a six week study. They lasted, the, the shortest one was two years long. The longest one was eight years long. And these were done in controlled environments where they knew what the people were eating and what they weren't eating. And those studies are about vegetable oils. And so we're all told to use vegetable shortening or canola because it will help lower your total cholesterol and lower your LDL. And that's true. Those vegetable seed oils do those things. If you stop eating saturated fat oils and eat those, they will lower your total cholesterol. But the problem is, is at the end of the studies, all three of them, the people who continue to eat butter and bacon and ground beef and egg yolks, the, the real fat that human beings are supposed to eat, they live longer. They had fewer heart attacks. Their cholesterol was higher, but they live longer. And so my question to that person who's spooky about, you know, oh, that'll make my cholesterol go up, is would you, would you like to have a higher cholesterol and live a longer life? Or would you like to have a lower cholesterol and live a shorter life? Because the people who ate the, the vegetable seed oils, they died sooner actually of heart attack. They died sooner of cancer. They died sooner of all causes than the people who were still allowed to eat ancestrally appropriate saturated animal fats. Those people in all three of these very well done studies, they live longer. And so I guarantee you, your doctor has never heard of these three studies because two out of the three were not published at all because that was, they were done back in the late sixties, early seventies when it was very fashionable to say saturated fats bad for you. And so when they saw these results come out, they just basically, they quietly just put those on the the bottom shelf in the back closet and forgot about them because if they had published that their career would have been ruined and so they just didn't publish the data and then one study did publish some data but but they didn't publish the part about the people eating saturated animal fat living longer and having fewer heart attacks and less cancer they just published the fact that eating the vegetable oil did lower cholesterol that's the part of the study they published so uh, basically we've been hoodwinked We've been misled, and I think the scientists, I don't think there's an evil conspiracy. I think they had the best of intentions. I think they believed in their heart of hearts that high cholesterol is bad for humans and will kill us prematurely. And so they thought they were doing a good thing, but, but I think we've all heard the saying about the best of intentions often uh, yield the most evil of results. And in this case, that's another example of that. They were trying to do what they thought was best, but they weren't listening to the data, which was trying to tell them, no, human beings need to eat lots of saturated animal fat. That's, what, that's why we became humans in the first place, was eating that diet. That's the healthiest diet for human beings. So would you then talk about what really <clears throat> does cause heart disease then? Because if it's not, if it's not this horrible cholesterol stuff that's circulating yep. around in our body, what actually is the cause of heart disease it's a combination of things that we're we can talk about and actually in one of the studies they actually did autopsies on everyone that died and the people who had replaced saturated animal fats with vegetable seed oils actually had more placking in their heart arteries than the people who were still eating the beef butter bacon eggs uh, egg yolks so right off the bat we get 
vegetable seed oils, which are have a very high omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. They're very inflammatory to the human biochemistry. And, the, and anything that causes inflammation in the inner wall of an artery is going to cause damage. And that's the damage that then your body uses cholesterol and, and fibrous tissue to try to fix that damage, right? And so that's the placking that we see build up in the heart. And the, the plaque is made of cholesterol, but that doesn't mean cholesterol caused the damage. Your body was trying to use cholesterol uh, like Spackle or like Bondo to try to seal that hole because it knows about cholesterol. It likes cholesterol, but it doesn't like damage to the inside of, of your arterial walls. Another thing that leads to the, the inflammation and damage is a chronically high blood sugar level hyperglycemia damages the insides of all your arteries in your entire body and you get hyperglycemia or high blood sugar from eating too many carbohydrates. When you do eat too many carbohydrates and spike your blood sugar, immediately your body secretes insulin to try to get that blood sugar back down to normal. Insulin at high levels, which we now refer to as hyperinsulinemia, also causes inflammation and damage to the inside of your arterial walls. So high sugar, high insulin, and high levels of inflammation from the vegetable seed oils, that's what leads to heart attack and stroke. And indeed, if we look back at the, the rate of heart attack and stroke, and we say, okay, let's start back in 1970 when most people still use butter and, and bacon grease and lard and beef tallow and sheep tallow, that's what they cook with, right? They started to replace all that with, with shortening and vegetable oil and Crisco and all the other processed crap, margarine. That's when everybody started to get obese. That's when they, the, the heart attack and stroke epidemics really started to just come out of nowhere. That's what was causing it, and plus the smoking as well. Yeah, so we're really focusing on the wrong contributing factor, aren't we? Yep. We've been we've been confused. And it's been a, a very popular fad in medicine and nutrition for the last 50 or 60 years to say that saturated fat is bad, that we should eat low fat, we should eat lots of, of fruits and veg. We always say the fruits first because we know people actually will eat those. They may not eat the veg. That's that's a fad diet. They're that Ultimately, when you go back and look at the totality of the research, there's no research supporting that diet. Indeed, when we go back and look at the Egyptian mummies, and this is a, this is a great story. So all Egyptians were mummified, not just the elite. A lot of people think it was just the pharaohs, but that's not true at all. Everybody, basically, if you had a job, if you weren't homeless or a criminal or a prisoner of war, you were mummified. And there were three different methods I did that with. And so we've got thousands of Egyptian mummies to go back and we can actually look at their heart arteries with an MRI or a CAT scan, or we can do an autopsy on them. And we can see the, the amount of plaquing. And the Egyptians had terrible teeth. They had terrible cavities. They had terrible dental abscesses. And they had terrible coronary artery disease. So... It's also the other good thing we have about Egyptian culture is we know exactly what kind of diet they ate based on carbon uh, and nitrogen isotope analysis and based on their cookbooks and their scrolls and, and the, the hieroglyphics that show what they ate. They ate basically an ovo pescatarian diet. They ate, they ate a little bit of fish, but mainly they lived on grains, beans and a little bit of fish here and there, a little bit of cheese here and there, a little bit of eggs here and there, but they ate a plant-based vegetarian diet. That's what they ate. They lived on grains and beans, which now we're told are super healthy, super heart healthy in fact, but that's the diet they lived on and you can't find a mummy over the age of 30 from Egypt that does not have coronary artery disease and in most cases a significant amount of placking in their coronary arteries. So we, we already have a civilization that ate the diet that we're told to eat. And if you look at a lot of the, the uh, statues from Egypt and a lot of the carvings, they had that little pooch, they had a little belly. And most of the men had uh, gynecomastia, which is basically man boots. That's in the statues. They, they, they didn't think that was attractive. That's just how everybody looked back then by eating lots of grains and lots of beans and not much meat. 
that's what we look like today when we eat a diet like that. We have a little belly pooch from the fatty liver, and, it, and if a, a man will have man boobs from the estrogenic quality of the grains and beans. It's not a healthy diet, but it is plant-based. And so most doctors don't look into paleoanthropology or archaeology. They just focus on what it says in their medical journals. So they never get that look at what other cultures who've already tried this diet that you're now recommending, this fad diet. It went out of fat, went out of fad for a long time because the Egyptians were very unhealthy. Now it's back in style again to eat a, a low fat plant-based diet, even though we've got more than enough evidence to show that it's not healthy for human beings. And, and doctors get things like the Eat Lancet report, you know, and, sure. yeah. and you know, all this sort of um, mm -hmm. suspect research that, that, yes. that they hold up to say, oh, well, you know, I'm doing best practice here. Yeah. And one of the things I talk about in my book is that doctors are just like you. You've got to understand that. You trust your doctor blindly. If your doctor says, take this pill, you, you take that pill. You, did, you don't research it. You don't look it up. What's the chemical structure of this? Is there, is there a fluorine atom in this? What's in this pill? You just take the pill. Doctors look up and blindly trust the big research uh, organizations like the Harvard School of Public Health and the Lancet Medical Journal. And so when something comes out that has Lancet in the name, every doctor is going to fall in line and follow that blindly because they're just like you. They're, the, the authorities who they trust, whether rightly or wrongly, they're going to follow them blindly. And so, yeah, 99% of doctors would recommend the Eat Lancet diet, even though it says in the Eat Lancet paperwork that it's not safe for, for young children, for breastfeeding moms and pregnant moms to eat that diet because it's not, it's not adequate. So, but yet it's somehow they recommend it. That's what's wrong with your doctor. That's why they're recommending this diet is because they blindly believe their authority figures, just like you blindly believe your authority figures. And that, and very often in my YouTube videos, I'll say, here's the research. I don't want you to blindly believe me or anybody else. And I think that's, that should come out of the mouth of every doctor. So can you um, explain to the listeners how a high carbohydrate diet affects them, you know, how it causes, how it contributes to overweightness and obesity, um, metabolic disorders and, you know, sure. prediabetes. Can you sure. sort of go through that pathway a little bit for them, please? So after, with, my, with my limited study of paleoanthropology and human nutrition and human medicine, it, it becomes quite obvious that human beings are by design low carbohydrate animals, just like your the, the lion in the wild and your cat sleeping on your kitchen counter, they are carnivores. They are supposed to only eat meat. That is how their body's designed. If you feed your cat kibble that has lots of grains and pea protein, your cat will get fat and get diabetes and get fatty liver. This is an epidemic of feline diabetes today. Every veterinarian knows that. It's not from the cats eating meat. That's their natural diet. That's their proper cat diet. But when you don't feed them their proper diet, they get fat, they get fatty liver, they get diabetes. Human beings are perhaps not obligate carnivores, but we are by design a low carbohydrate, salty mammal. We need lots of salt, we need lots of fat, and we need lots of protein, and we need a very small amount, if any, of carbohydrates. But when you look at the average person, they're eating a high carbohydrate diet, probably anywhere from 50 to 75% of their calories are coming from carbohydrates. That's too many carbohydrates for us. That's not a proper human diet. And so they're having blood sugar spikes every time they eat. Then they're having an insulin spike to try to, to fight back down the blood sugar. So they're having chronic hyperglycemia and chronic, chronic hyperinsulinemia. Also, if they're eating lots of fruit or drinking fruit juices or drinking soft drinks, they're getting way too much fructose in their diet. Fructose is not metabolized like glucose. It actually has to go through the liver. It's converted to fatty acids. It's stored as fat in your liver or on your belly or on your booty or somewhere else you'd rather not have stored fat. Fructose, too much fructose is absolutely going to give you fatty liver, but too much just sugar is going to do the same thing. And so they're getting, and then they're getting all the inflammatory 
vegetable seed oils. That's making the inflammation worse. And so that's a, that is literally the perfect diet to produce obese, pre-diabetic or diabetic human beings with placking in their arteries and fatty livers and all of the other chronic diseases that come from eating this kind of diet, including eczema, psoriasis, rosacea, chronic heartburn, chronic constipation, chronic diarrhea, chronic joint pain, uh, all those things come from this diet because we're telling people to eat a diet that is not the proper human diet. So, you know, that raises some really interesting questions about chronic disease. And, you know, one of the common myths we have is about cancer is about cancer and eating too much protein, eating too much meat causes cancer. Yep. Can you talk about the insulin connection with cancer? Yeah, there's, there's literally no protein connection with cancer whatsoever. The uh, World Health Organization tried to say that red meat is a carcinogen and that definitely processed meat is a carcinogen. But when you actually look into the research that they use to back up that opinion, it's atrocious. It's just ridiculous research. It's observational studies based on food frequency questionnaires, and it shows a very tiny, tiny relative risk, which does not prove or cause anything. It's just an observational study. So they don't have any research to back up the fact that red meat causes cancer. And the American College of Physicians actually came out and published a study and said, yeah, the research showing that red meat or processed meat causes cancer doesn't show anything actually, it's just dumb. And so they stepped away from that and said, eat as much red meat as you want, eat as much processed meat as you want, until such time that we have actual real research showing that meat's not the problem. So now we're back to sugar and, and insulin. Cancer loves sugar. This is undebatable. Some cancers are able to use fatty acids and can survive on fatty acids. But the majority of cancers thrive and multiply on sugar. And so a high carbohydrate diet is, is the diet of choice. If cancer could check the box and tell you which diet to eat, it would be a high carbohydrate diet full of fruits and fruit juices and soft drinks and bread and, and, and fried potatoes. That's the diet cancer prefers. And I actually have a YouTube video going into more detail about this. But uh, a lot of your listeners may have heard of PET scans which is a way we actually look for cancer in the human body. It's a very, very technologically advanced scan. Works very well. How does a PET scan actually work? They actually attach sugar, a sugar molecule, to the molecule they're gonna look for with the PET scan because they know that cancer is gonna take that sugar up immediately. And so on the PET scan, cancer, cancerous areas, and any part of your body with a high, high metabol metabolism rate is going to glow on the PET scan. That's how we find cancer is by giving it sugar attached to the PET scan molecule. And then the cancer immediately pulls the sugar out of circulation. So you can imagine the more sugar you put into your diet, the, if you have a small cancer somewhere, you're just feeding the cancer. If you don't have cancer, then the chronic inflammation from the diet you're eating is going to increase your risk of developing cancer, and then you're eating the sugar that the cancer needs to grow. It's uh -huh. literally a perfect cancer-provoking diet that that people in the United States and New Zealand are being told to eat right now by the the current powers that be. And people undergoing cancer treatment have just fed all this stuff, you know. Absolutely, um, yeah. It's it's atrocious. The doctors and nurses obviously don't know better yet. But yeah, if, if someone has cancer, the last thing they need to be eating is a big bowl of oatmeal and some whole wheat toast and drinking a glass of fresh squeezed orange juice. All three of those things break down into pure sugar. They're going to spike your blood sugar, spike your insulin level, and that's, that's it. Cancer's off to the races again. And one of the other things I think is quite interesting about the, the meat causing cancer is, you know, presumably it's from the amino acids. And so if we're eating a plant-based diet and we're getting amino acids, don't they cause cancer? Oh, Even no, they're, they're, they're magical phyto amino acids. <laughs> they don't cause cancer. Yeah. So how would, how would people go and talk to their GPs about this stuff? Um, 
you know, for probably nearly 15 years, I've been talking about the insulin connection with um, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. And um, over here, we can, you know, I can write out a list of blood tests and ask my clients to go to their GP and have those approved. And, you know, the GPs ridicule me, they ridicule the, the patients, they just say it's not scientific. Um, yeah. How how would someone like me be able to engage in a conversation with GPs? Because I think we need to work together and they play a vital role in the yep. whole health process. I agree. And how do we do it respectfully and how do we get yep. them on board? So uh, I think you said the key, the key word is respectfully. I think we should be respectful to all professionals, uh, doctors included. But you have to keep in mind, what did I say earlier? Doctors are people just like you. And so you know that about 10% of the, the average people you meet on the street are assholes. They just are, <laughs> right? And that, that rule applies to doctors as well. So if you happen to have one of those doctors, probably your best bet if, if it's an option is to just change doctors. And so if your doctor starts to belittle you or starts to, to make fun of you, or starts to just look down their nose at you like, you're you silly mortal, you don't even know anything, that is a sign that that doctor may be an asshole, and you may need to switch doctors if that's possible. Secondly, a good doctor is always curious. A good doctor is always looking and going, why in the world? I mean, and that's a valid question for a doctor. If they don't know what you and I know, they may say, why in the world would you want to see peptide? What's that going to show you? I don't even understand. Well, if, if you do that right with your doctor, then that's actually a learning experience for your doctor. You say, yes, yeah, really amazing what you can tell from an A1C and a C peptide and from you know all these other labs that I want to get checked. It really gives you a different look at the human body over and above just checking a total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. Because don't, those don't really tell you much, except maybe I need a statin, which is what the doctor's gonna say next, right? So if you approach them respectfully, have some stuff printed out. I've got tons of research on my YouTube channels uh, that you can print out and say, hey, look, this is a big deal. Here's a study about this. And if you show a good doctor, which 90% I think are, if you show them a study, they're at least going to take that and say, oh, I'll take a look at that later. I, I don't have time right now, but I'm going to look at that later. And another good trick, if you just see that you, being respectful and asking nicely is not going to get it, here's a trick. I'm going to give your listeners an inside trick from a doctor that I shouldn't tell you, but I'm going to tell you anyway. If your doctor just refuses to order the test that you asked for, you're going to say the following. Okay, doctor, I understand. I need you to do something for me. I need you to document in my permanent medical record that I was concerned about my health because I have risk factors for you know different chronic diseases. And I was very concerned about my health. And I asked for these tests after I had done hours of research and you refused to order them. Could you please document that in my, my permanent medical record, please? What and then sit there quietly and don't say a word, just sit there and your doctor's gonna do one of two things. They're either gonna reveal themselves to be an asshole and kick you out of their office, or they're gonna say, fine, what were, the, what were the tests again? Because no doctor wants to record in the permanent medical record that you asked for a test and you had research and, and, and reasoning behind that, and they refused to order that. No doctor wants to write that in the permanent medical record. Just a uh, doctor listening to this, that would make them nervous, just me telling this story. They'd be like, no, well, what do you want? I'll just, I'm mean, an insurance man, I pay for it, I don't know, but if you want it, I'll order it, and you can pay for it, whatever, I don't care. And so that's an excellent hack to get past a doctor who's like, I'm not gonna order that, I don't even know what the results would be. Oh, that's, that's very insightful, thank you. I'm sure lots of people will appreciate, will appreciate, um, will appreciate that. You know, often um, when tests come back, doctors just say, oh, everything's all good, no problem, you know. Yep. And, you know, HbA1c is one of those classics. And yet, you know, if we were to do a C-peptide test or even, you know, even if we were to do insulin, um, you know, we would see that it was sort of being artificially kept down. Do you want to right. talk a bit about that? Yes. And so you can have hyperinsulinemia for up to 20 years before you develop 
prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. And in my estimation, you know, 88% uh, of the U.S. population right now has at least one marker of metabolic syndrome. And that's why is because they're all hyperinsulinemic from eating the high carbohydrate plant-based diet that they already eat. So a C-peptide, I like that test a lot because insulin fluctuates constantly from minute to minute, depending on whether you've eaten or not. And C-peptide is a lot more like a hemoglobin A1C in that respect. It's a much more stable number. And so if, you, if your C-peptide, so it's just the letter C with a dash and then the word peptide. That's the name of that test. It is the best proxy marker for what your average insulin secretion has been over the last 24 hours. So that's an excellent marker as to whether you're hyperinsulinemic or not. And so you may not have any diabetes at all. You may, you may even have a normal fasting blood sugar but if your C-peptide is, your result is even one-tenth of a point higher than normal, so 0.1 above whatever the normal range is, then you're hyperinsulinemic. You are secreting more insulin than you should be because you're eating more carbohydrates than you should be. And that, that fight between your pancreas's beta cells and the carbohydrate amount of your food each day that fight can go on for years before your actual cells become insulin resistant enough that now you've got a high blood sugar from eating basically the same diet you were eating two years ago or 10 years ago. So there's nothing magical that changes in your body that makes you a, a type two diabetic. Basically, you, you stay hyperinsulinemic for so long that your cells downregulate the, the ability of your insulin receptor on individual cell membranes to work properly. And so when you, when you can be hyperinsulinemic for years and not be a type two diabetic, but when you become, a, when you're hyperinsulinemic for long enough that you also become insulin resistant, that's when prediabetes and type two diabetes starts to show its head because no matter how much insulin you produce, you can't get the blood sugar back down to normal and that's when the blood sugar starts to show up high. And that's when the average doctor wakes up and goes, oh, your blood sugar's a little high. You may be moving towards type 2 diabetes. When in reality, you've been moving towards type 2 diabetes for 20 years, but your doctor never checked to see peptides, so they had no idea. And, and then we give type 2 diabetics insulin. You yeah. Know. And, and, and again, this is not an evil conspiracy. The doctors mean well by that, because if you give a type 2 diabetic insulin injections, their blood sugar will come down, their A1C will come down, but at what cost? Because remember earlier we said that having chronically high insulin levels is probably just as dangerous, if not more dangerous, than having a high blood sugar. So now they actually feel like, oh, I can eat more pie, more cake, and more cookies because I'm taking insulin, so they're going to gain much more weight because they're chronically hyperglycemic and hyperinsulinemic. Yeah, it's, it's, just, it's a travesty when a, a, a well-meaning doctor starts a type 2 diabetic on insulin injections. It's, it, it, it is, in effect, malpractice, but the doctor just doesn't know better yet, and that's why I'm constantly doing interviews and making videos and, and trying to write a second book is to help wake, wake doctors up. Well, I because hope. if I help one doctor or one health care provider, if I help one of those understand then they're going to help hundreds of patients, aren't they? They are. And this interview yeah. is going to be really important, I think, for people to be able to um, go and talk to their doctors and even perhaps share this and a lot yes. of your other information with their GPs and just yes. give them that opportunity. So when people are taking exogenous insulin, then they're causing more damage to the insulin receptors, down-regulating um, glucose uptake, even further and then we end up with this you know they say it's chronic and progressive and people end up on all these other medications um you know blindness you know limb amputations you know all these terrible things yes. that happen with diabetes absolutely right and the problem is is everybody in the equation has a good heart and is well-meaning but they just haven't thought it through. I, I liken it to back to when everybody believed that the sun rotated around the earth. 
they, they believed that and they would fight and die for that belief, right? But when somebody stepped up and said, actually, it looks like it's the other way around. I mean, that person was persecuted, if not, if not martyred because of that belief. But, and so everybody that, that gave him or her the poison or the arrow or the sword or whatever they gave them, they, meant, they thought that guy was just a kook, was just crazy. There's no way everybody knows, all the leading authorities know that the sun rotates around the earth, dummy. What are you talking about? But that person let the cat out of the bag. And then several other people went, I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting idea, isn't it? Hmm. Let, me, let me just watch. And, and then they started saying, well, actually, that agrees with the research I've done better than the, the sun rotating around the earth. Uh, the numbers come out better if you say the earth is rotating around the sun. And so slowly but surely, that correct idea, which was initially beat down with the, the sharp edge of a sword, now is considered settled science. Yes, of course, the earth rotates around the sun. We've known this, it's, it's known science. But when that idea first came out, and that's what the low carb keto carnivore movement, we're kind of in that stage right now where the, the majority of the, the powers that be in medicine and nutrition and research, they first heard about low carb and they're like, that's ridiculous. What? No, of course we're supposed to eat lots of fruits and veg. What are you talking about? But then they start looking, here's a research study. Oh, here's another research study. I just published on my Facebook page the other day, a link with all of the, the low carb research now that supports a low carb diet. There's tons of it. And so once they start to see that, they're like, huh, that's intriguing. Let me look into that a little more. And so now we're starting to shift the paradigm of all these nutrition and medical experts slowly, but surely. And so rather than wait 20 or 30 years for mainstream nutrition and science to come around to the, the obvious fact that the earth rotates around the sun, I decided to reach out with a YouTube channel and a Twitter and a Facebook page and, and reach just regular people and say, hey, that actually that advice you're getting from your nutritionist and your doctor's wrong. Here's, here's the proper human diet. Try this for a month and see what happens. Well, that's, that's really fantastic. And I'm really hoping that this will um, get people interested and start following your channel um, because you have just, so you have hours and hours of just um, fantastic information on there, which everyone needs to hear. So oh, I'm, I'm sort of trying to run a, well, not trying, I am going to run, I am running a program, um, a campaign throughout New Zealand, because I want to get New Zealand healthy again, back to the health we had when I was growing up. Um, and I know it's going to be like, pushing uphill with a pointed stick, but... What, um, are your, what are your current rates of obesity and type 2 uh, diabetes and fatty liver? Is it as bad as the United States? Yeah, we're, we are increasing. We're the fastest increasing country in the world. Uh, we're not quite... We're not, we're not the highest in actual rates, but we're increasing um, at the fastest rates. So it's time for you to do your good work. Uh, yeah. Somebody has to, like, if we don't make a start, um, and if we don't start getting these conversations going, which is why I'm so grateful to you, um, and I really hope people will go and start listening to your information. And there's lots of others out there in the, um, you know, in this kind of area as well. But, you know, the kids worry me. And I don't know if you've got any, you know, sort of, last thoughts to parents i know you've just got a young you've just had a young son haven't you is he yeah like six months old yeah we we have beckett he's seven months old now and he has six teeth <laughs> and he uses those teeth to eat uh scrambled eggs fried in bacon grease he used the uses those teeth to eat beef brisket which is a very fatty cut of beef he uh i will we actually have a good recycling program in my house because when we order ribs I eat all the meat off the rib, and then I give the rib with the little remnants left to Becky. And he cleans the rib thoroughly with his six little teeth. And then when he drops it in the floor, the dog takes it from there. So there's no waste <laughs> at, at our house at all. He has like tried that. an avocado. He likes it okay. He likes guacamole a lot if it has a lot of cilantro. He likes um, pickles. He likes olives. 
he and but mainly 90% of his diet, 95%, uh, he's still exclusively breastfed except for eating meat. And I think that is the proper way to wean a, a young child from the breast to solid food. It's not with mushed up peaches. It's not with rice cereal. It's not with any of this stuff that we didn't even have access to 50,000 years ago. 50,000 years ago, what did we wean a child off the breast onto? Meat. Maybe a little veg, but it was mainly meat. It was liver. And uh, his next two things we're going to try is he's going to try a little bite of chicken liver and he's going to try a little bite of fish roe or caviar because they're so full of omega-3 fatty acids and all the vitamins and minerals. But that's the kind of stuff he's going to cut his teeth on. So his palate is not going to be mucked up with all the sugary cereals and the starchy different little fruits and veggies. He's going to eat foods that are full of amino acids and fatty acids and vitamins and minerals because that is the proper human diet regardless of how young or how old you are. Well, our rates of diabetes are increasing in children by three to five percent per year. Yeah, so yeah it's a tragedy. If we don't do something, you know, what's that going to say in 10 years time? And yes, and you know, we're just really taking away Kids, li kids' lives in their childhood. Um, yeah, I want people to stop considering it uh, mean to a child to not give them that pastry or not give them that pie or cake. That's not mean. What's mean to a child is giving them type 2 diabetes before they're even of age to vote. What's mean to children is giving them fatty liver or giving them some inflammatory condition or even an autoimmune condition by feeding them foods that although they're recommended by the powers that be absolutely contribute to high blood sugar high insulin and high levels of inflammation it's not mean to take the candy bar away from your child and put a, a beef rib in, in its place that's not mean what's mean is to give your child morbid obesity before they ever even have a chance to run and play and be a happy healthy child well, I think those are <clears throat> fantastic words that I hope every parent and grandparent out there will take on board and think about because it is our responsibility. And I talk about it as just being another form of child abuse, really, which I get a bit of kickback for because I'm a yeah. bit a bit harsh, but it really I is think it's another appropriate. form of child abuse. Child yes, abuse. totally yeah. agree. Yeah, give your child some whiskey, give your child a cigarette and give your child a candy bar. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't, I can't dis determine which one would be worse for your child. Yeah, yeah. I want to be really respectful of your time, but I do have another question um, because this comes up quite a lot with my clients. I have many clients who have had their gallbladder removed and they have been told by their doctors that they can't eat a low carb diet or a, a higher fat diet. What, what's your comments about that? Well, the reason the doctor is saying that is because they have an incomplete understanding of human anatomy and physiology. The gallbladder does store and concentrate bile. There's, that's absolutely true. But what these doctors don't understand is that when you take someone's gallbladder out, the, the, the bile ducts themselves in the liver can actually dilate and take on the same function of storage and concentration of bile. And so doctors either never learned that or they forgot that. And so they think that this person cannot eat fatty meat or they'll have diarrhea because of all the fat because they no longer have a gallbladder. And indeed, if you don't have a gallbladder, once you transition from a high carbohydrate plant-based diet over to a fatty meat heavy ketogenic diet, you may have a few weeks of gastrointestinal distress that you may, but that's your body converting its anatomy and physiology over to be able to cope with that diet. And most, some people will take an ox bile supplement uh, short term, some long term, but most people it's just for a month or two. And, and it, when they run out of that, they don't need it anymore because their bile ducts have dilated enough that they're able to store enough bile and concentrate enough bile that they can eat the fattiest meal that anyone could eat. And they're not going to have GI distress. 
That's great. Thank you very much. I'll make sure that all my um, all my gallbladder <laughs> clients um, yes. hear, hear that little bit of information. So for somebody wanting to start a lower carb diet or a ketogenic diet, and there's so many different versions out there, and you know, I try not to get too hung up on the names. How would you propose they make a start. I mean, I always suggest let's get rid of all the processed food first. Yep. And then... Yeah, so my, I have three steps, uh, four steps really, but they're very easy and they don't use any of the trigger words. So step one is to remove all sugar from your diet, whether added sugar or natural sugar. So by natural sugar, you mean fruits and cereals yeah. and... Yep. Yeah, that's exactly right. So any of any of the fruits that are and so uh, eating a few berries is okay because they're they have more fiber and they don't have as much sugar. But e any fruit and I've got several videos about this on my YouTube channel. That's step one: remove all sugar from the diet. Step two: remove all grains from the diet. This is wheat, rice, oats, corn, millet, amaranth, quinoa, rye. All those guys they are very inflammatory to the human body. They are not part of the proper human diet and they break down into sugar. So back to step number one, right? So step two, eliminate all grains from your diet. Grains are great for humans to keep us from starving to death. So if you're a slave or a prisoner of war, eat grains, that way you won't starve. But if you're wanting optimal health, you gotta get the grains out of your diet. Then step three is to get rid of all industrial vegetable seed oils right? And so that's, that's canola, that's corn oil, that's peanut oil, that's safflower, sunflower, soybean oil. None of those are healthy for human beings. So once you do those three steps, you're going to take care of all the processed food because you can't make processed food without at least two of those three things, right? And most processed food, food has all three of those things in it. Then step four would be to start eating lots of fatty meat. And so let three quarters of your plate, two thirds to three quarters, be covered with fatty meats. And then if you wanna add some, a little veg or a few berries on that one quarter that's left, that's fine, you can do that. But that, just those four steps is going to reverse prediabetes in everybody who has it. It's gonna reverse fatty liver in everybody who has it. It's gonna uh, reverse type two diabetes. It's gonna make all of the inflammatory skin conditions and joint conditions and gut conditions better because you're removing the inflammatory grains and the inflammatory vegetable seed oils. That, that's great. What, what would you say to people who get a bit constipated when they start that process? What happens for most people is not that they get constipated when they start eating a fatty meat heavy keto diet. What actually happens is, is they just don't poop as much as they used to. They don't have the cramping like they used to. They don't have the volume of, of feces that they once did. And they don't have to poop four times a day like they used to. And so to a lot of people, that feels like constipation. They're, and they're thinking in their head, you know, I used to have three humongous poops a day. And I haven't pooped at all today. I'm constipated. Well, the problem with that way of thinking is the, there's actually a medical definition of constipation, which consists of pain on defecation, bleeding on defecation, straining, cramping on defecation. Those are the, def that's the definition of actual constipation. Just the fact that you haven't pooped in the last four hours, that doesn't mean you're constipated. When you're eating a fatty meat heavy con uh, keto diet, you're eating a very nutrient dense diet. You're not eating a lot of stuff that needs to be pooped out later. You're going to digest and use all of that. And uh, the, the prime example is the ultimate keto diet, which is a carnivore diet. We eat as close to zero grams of carbohydrates as you can get a day. And the average carnivore after being carnivore for a few weeks, they might poop a, a very small amount of poop every other day because meat is the ultimate nutrient, nutrient dense superfood. We absorb every single thing that's in the meat. There's almost no waste left over to poop out. Oh, thank you for that. And I just want to remind everybody that if they go to your YouTube channel, 
um, they can find copious amounts of this information and a lot more detail about some of the things that we've just sort of briefly touched on today. Yes, Dr. Perry, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for coming on. I think people will just love this information over here. There's a real deficit of this kind of information in New Zealand and I really, really appreciate your time. And I encourage everyone to go and get your book. I've got the um, audio version and the Kindle version because it means I can, I can listen and then I can go back and find the bits that, you know, I sort of want to think about a bit, a bit more. So, well, um, it was a great pleasure to chat with you. And I, I hope that you continue to do the good work that you're doing. And it was an absolute pleasure. I'd be happy to do it again in the future if you like. Oh, I would love that. Um, there's so many other topics we can touch on. So I will definitely take you up on that offer. Thank you very much. Absolutely.